Y'all been y'all been falling down. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what kids parents around there. Better be on your best behavior. Oh, y'all getting whooped. <laughs> How's everybody doing today? <laughs> yeah, no, you can't move on. Don't have any time to like kids. Not mine. All right. You want to come to For everybody who don't know who I am, I'm, uh, my name is Pastor David. And um, me and Daniel go, we go way back, man. A lot of history and ministry and a lot of, a lot of street ministry and just uh, preaching at different facilities together at, at separate times and stuff like that. And so, uh, Daniel reached out to me and asked me if I would be willing to come out and speak today. And uh, without hesitation, I immediately was like, yeah, I would love to come out here and uh, speak. And so, man, I'm, I'm super grateful for the opportunity to come here. It's an honor for me um, in the house of the Lord this morning and uh, just to bring the word. So I'm, I'm super excited about what God is going to do in here today. And, and, and I believe this is a message um, not just for this church building or the people of this church, but for the church as a whole, it's a universal message that God is trying to, wanting to speak to his His, his body of believers and his bride. And so um, we're going to jump into the message very quickly. But before I, before I do, I want to pray. Um, we can't bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, God, for this day that you have given each and every one of us in this room. God, you said we're two or more are gathered, are gathered, that you are in the midst. So we welcome you right here into this sanctuary, God. God, I ask that you would give us ears to hear what you want to say to us today. God, that you would give us eyes to see what you want to show us today. God, we invite you into every one of our problems today. We invite you into our pain. We invite you into every area of our life to just invade us and do what you want to do with our lives today. And God, I just pray that the message, God, that your word, that as it goes forth, God, that every seed that is sown into the hearts of every person in here today, God, that it would bear fruit. God, that we will not walk out of these doors the same as we came in. And we thank you so much for everything that you have done for us and what you're going to continue to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Oh, so we're going to be coming out of Revelations chapter 2 starting with verses one through five. But before I get there, I want to kind of explain how I ended up at this this passage and how I got my message for today. Um, I actually prepared this message for, uh, a, I prepared part of this message for a different church that I spoke at Wednesday on a night called Strive Night where people just gather and just come together and they worship and uh, just kind of let the spirit do whatever the spirit wants to do. And, and um, so they asked me to prepare a 10 minute devotional and um, so I, I prepared part of this message for Wednesday. Then I prepared second part of this message for my church on Friday night. I, I, I preached Friday night. And then so the rest of it is, is kind of prepared for y'all. So it's just kind of God's been kind of building on to this message. And um, I, I started a series last week, preaching a series called Established. I asked the Lord to give me a, a word for the year at the beginning of the year. He gave me the word Established. And so I always ask God, give me a word that's going to kind of shape and define my life for this year, like a work that you want to do in my life. So he gave me the word established. And uh, so I, I looked up that word, and, and the word established means to make firm or stable, to introduce and cause to grow and multiply, or to prove or put beyond doubt. And so he gave me that word at the beginning of the year, and then 2020 hit, COVID-19 hit. It seems like, man, this isn't really anything being established. It seems like things are crumbling and falling apart. But what God started to show me was what he was doing is he was he, he was removing the crutch from his church. That a lot of us had started to rely and depend on our finances and on, 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 on with finding our security in these temporary things of the world. And as a result, it has pulled us away from what we're really supposed to lean on, which is the gospel and which is his grace and his peace and his strength. And so the Lord started showing me, I am establishing my people again. That as my people learn that they cannot rely on these things and all of these things are temporary and they come back to me, I will start to establish them, make them firm, make them stable. I will cause them to grow. And as a result, they will multiply. They will make disciples. And so the Lord started showing me this. So I started a series uh, last week uh, called Established. And, and, I, and I planned on jumping into Acts chapter 2. Um, but the Lord woke me up Monday morning 
uh, at 3 30 a.m. And, and I heard these three phrases. I heard experience the love of God, understand the will of God, and pursue the call of God. Experience the love of God, understand the will of God, and pursue the call of God. And what was very interesting to me was the order that God gave them to me. Because if we haven't experienced the love of God, we can't understand the will of God. And if we don't understand the will of God, we can't pursue the call of God. And so I, I started to really press in, Lord, what, what are you really trying to show me through this? And um, what's crazy is, 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 is I, as I was writing these phrases down the next day, I, I changed the word experience to, to uh, um, encounter the love of God. And so I was telling my wife what I was preparing for Wednesday, and she said, what, what are the phrases again? And I said, encounter the love of God, understand the will of God, and pursue the call of God. She said, I don't know why, but I just keep hearing the word experience. <laughs> and I was like, ooh. So she walked out of my room, and, and, and I waited a while, and then I called her back into my room. I said, man, that, I'm going to tell you how crazy it is that you just said that. I'm like, when the Lord woke me up, like, he told me to write down, experience the love of God, understand the will of God, and pursue the call of God. But I just thought, encounter the love of God was, it, it's, it's, it's kind of the same as experiencing the love of God, right? And she was like, well, you might want to change back to what God told you to, to, to put it in the first place. So um, I, I want to show you what the Lord has, has really been speaking to me. What I believe the church is suffering from today, not only here in America, but in many parts of the world, is lack of experience. Lack of experience. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the type of experience that comes in the secret place and in that quiet place and in your alone time with God and in relationship with God, experiencing his love over and over and over and over again. So the Lord has shown me my, my, my bride is suffering from a lack of experience. Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 through 5 says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen, Repent and do the works you did at first. And here we see Jesus. He's saying, man, I, 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 I see your works. He's saying, I, I see your experience in ministry. I see your ability to discern what good and evil is. I see that you don't tolerate people who, who, who come into the church and try to, to, to destroy this, the church. He said, man, I see the persecution that you've endured. Not only the persecution that you've endured, but the persecution you've endured for my name's sake. He's saying, I see, I see your experience. He said, you, you, you've grown in areas, in, 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 in areas that look righteous. You've grown in ministry. You've grown in these different things, but you've also grown cold. So your love for me is not there anymore. It looks like you love me. People are being saved. The church is growing, but it looks like, looks like you love me, but your love for me has, has grown cold. He said, what you suffer from? It's a lack of experience. You got experience, but you lack experience. And he's telling me. He says, repent. He said, remember where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. The thing is, 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 is when we first, when we first received the love of God, when we first experienced the love of God, our love for him increased hunger for him increased. We couldn't get enough of him. We couldn't, we were never satisfied with just a little bit of him. We had to, we had to grow in our love for him because there was this freedom that came from experiencing the love of Jesus and it increased everything in our life. Our, our spiritual senses, senses were heightened. Everything in our life started to grow. And he's saying, man, look, you, you, you need to get back to that. Do the works you did at first. <clears throat> and so I want to talk today about what that love, and I'm not going to go through all three of these different, you know, experience the love of God, understand the will of God, and pursue the call of God, because we all, we all know that all of it stems from experience and his love. And so what I want to talk about today 
is what the love of God is. What does that look like? What does the love of God look like? And first, my first point is the love of God is free. God's love is free. You can't earn the love of God, and God will never love you any more or any less than he does right now, right here in this moment. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8 says, For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You will always be on the receiving end of this gospel. That while we were still sinners, while we were still chasing the things of the world, while we didn't even want to know about him or want to pursue him or even hated people who did pursue him, he still died for us. And why is it that, 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 that we received that love at first, but somehow we moved into this place where we think we got to go do this checklist mentality and earn the love of God? You can't earn the love of God. The Bible tells us that our righteousness is like filthy rags to God. That our righteousness is like filthy rags to him. But somehow we think we can earn his love. The other day, my daughter, she, my daughter, Jayla, she's my second youngest daughter. She, she came into my office as I was preparing a message. And as I was preparing this message, she came in and, and she had tears in her eyes and so I stopped what I was doing and I, and I grabbed her and I said, what's, what's wrong with you? Are you? Why are you crying? She looked up at me and she said, trembling as she spoke to Daddy, are, are, am I special to you? She said, Daddy, am I, am, am, am I special to you? And can I tell y'all that, that that ripped my heart out? That it, 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 it really broke me. I grabbed her and I hugged her and of course you're special to me. You mean the the world to me. I would, I would die for you. Like, I'd give everything to you. Yeah, of course you're special to me. But it broke my heart because my daughter had to, to wonder whether or not she was loved by her father. See, unlike our, our Heavenly Father, I'm flawed as a father. Unlike our Heavenly Father, I will put things before my children and even sacrifice my children, so to speak, on the altar of ministry, trying to pursue the call of God. Sometimes even ministry can take the place of, 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 of the intimacy that I should spend you know, with my daughter. But what my daughter was, what was, was, was lacking was she was lacking experiencing the love of her father. So since she didn't experience the love of her father, she started to wonder, she began to wonder whether or not she was special anymore. And I feel like that's how a lot of us are right now in our walks with God today, that we're wondering whether or not we can still be used by God, whether or not we still have any value in his eyes. We're, what we're suffering from is a lack of experience. And so I realized like, I, gotta, I gotta spend more time with my daughter. I gotta tell her more often that she's beautiful. But can, do, do, do you know that, that, that our father, he, he's always telling us that we are his prized possession, that we are his payment, that all, he, all, all he, he, he wants, all he seeks from us is intimacy with him, relationship with us, that he desired it so badly that he sent his son to die on the cross for you while you didn't even want. One of my points in our attempts, in our attempts to earn the love of God, we forfeit the experience that comes from his love being freely given. I'll say that again. In our attempts to earn the love of God, we forfeit the experience that comes from his love being freely given. You can't earn it, church. You can't. We're wondering why God, why am I, why, why, why am I in this dry season, God? How come I can't feel your presence anymore, God? Because we're trying to earn His love. It's free. If we'll just sit there and we'll just we'll just receive it. God, you're so good to me. Meditate on the things He's already done for you. Think back to the places He's all remember. He said, remember where you have from where you have fallen and repent. Sometimes it's, it's, I can tell you, I can be honest and tell you, I forget where I came from sometimes. 
I forget that I was once in a motel room with a trash bag of clothes and a needle and a spoon when I cried out to Jesus. And somehow I can think that I got my life together all of a sudden and I've done some things in my own strength. Sometimes I got to go back to where I came from just to remember how good God is. Amen. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 9, he says, But God is so rich in mercy. And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. You see that? God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for that. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. We can sum the whole gospel up in this. That God made him who knew no sin to be sin in order that we might become the righteousness of God. No matter which angle we look at it, you can flip that Bible a, a million different angles and you will always be on the receiving end of the gospel that God made him who knew no sin to be sin in order that we might become the righteousness of God. Secondly, the love of God is free in. F-R-E-E-I-N-G. The love of God is free in. Romans chapter 8 verses 1 through 2 says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. We see Paul state two things that we are free from just in this small statement. And the first one is condemnation. He said there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Why does Paul feel like he needs to mention condemnation? Because Paul understands that condemnation, self-condemnation leads to self-destruction. Self-condemnation leads to self-destruction. I mean, we, we've been there. I slipped. I fell. I should have done that with that person, but I did it anyway. Seared my conscience, so I'm just going to go all the way back into the world. And I'm going to walk away from God. And I'm going to destroy my life. Self-condemnation leads to self-destruction. If you buy into the lie that God doesn't love you, you will cease to love yourself. If you buy into the lie that God doesn't love you, you will cease to love yourself. What happens when we don't love ourselves? We can't properly love our children. We can't properly love our spouses. We can't properly love anything. One of my points, condemnation is the enemy's way of placing you in the judgment seat against yourself. Condemnation is the enemy's way of placing you in the judgment seat against yourself. It's him handing you the reins. Like, I ain't even got to stand and accuse him anymore. I'm just going to let him accuse himself. Starts with his accusation. Then it's you. Against yourself, deeply rooted. That is something that, it, that has to be freed by God. And I love what Paul says, what frees it. That, that's the good news. As Paul tells us, what frees us of that condemnation? Paul says that those who belong to Jesus, that there's freedom from this condemnation and belonging. Amen. That we, as we, if, if we belong to God, then we know that nothing and anything can ever separate us from his love. John chapter 10, verses 10 through 15, Jesus is talking to his, his disciples. He says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have came that they may have life and have it to the full. Or some translations say and have it more abundantly. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who does not want, does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and run, the sheep and run away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. 
I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. See that? So he said, I'm, I'm, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the, I'm the true shepherd. He said, I'm, I'm not some higher hand. That I don't get paid to do this, that you are my payment. He said, and I don't, I don't run when I see the wolf coming. That I don't run when life gets hard and things start to fall apart. That I'm not, I'm not scared of your problems. I'm not scared of your mess. He said, and I don't run when I see the wolf coming. I'm the, the good shepherd. He said, I lay down my life for you. He said, I lay down my life for you. I don't just say I love you. I demonstrate it. To show you that I love you, I, I, I went to the cross for the forgiveness of your sin. I'm telling you, church, he, he's trying to free us of this self-righteousness that we try to obtain. He's trying to free us from this pharisaical spirit that has crept into the church that somehow we think that in our own works, in our own righteousness, that we can, we can be right, made right in his sight. But our righteousness looks like rags to him. And he's saying if we can get back to just belonging in him and resting in him and abiding in him and abiding in his love, uh, you will start to see the revival that you know that we need to see in this nation. He said, I came that they may have life. That's this vigorous vitality that we should have as a church. That we shouldn't walk around as a church bitter and sorrowful, but we should be full of life and there should be abundant joy in us. There should be something contagious about his bride that when people see us they need to say, then people got something different that I don't have. And it's time to wake up as a church and understand. I love how when Peter preached his first sermon, he looked at this crowd full of thousands of people who were nowhere near the crucifixion when it took place. And he said, this Jesus whom you crucified, he said, man, he's the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. And he said, you nailed him to the cross. But they were nowhere to be found when he was crucified. What was he saying? He said, we need to understand that every time that we have sinned, we were guilty of the nails that penetrated his hand. But somehow we focus on everybody else and their fault and their failures failures and their flaws and think that somehow we're more righteous than the person standing on the corner of the street. Your righteousness is filthy rags to It's time to grow in his love and in his grace and in his mercy and receive it and allow this real, true, abundant life and joy and this work and the anointing and everything else that comes with just loving and abiding in him. Everything that comes from him, all this inward work that we allow to take place will naturally be expressed in our walk. There will be works that people will be able to see. Don't get me wrong, man. I'm not saying that we should we should use the grace of God as 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 a, a, a license for immorality. Not at all. We would never trample on the blood of Jesus as something worthless, as Paul says. But I'm saying there should be something done inside of us that naturally comes out. And somehow, as a church, this is what Paul spent his whole life in, defending the gospel. Because of this right here, because of these things creeping into the church. Hyper grace and hyper works. Paul, all of that, gone. Love Jesus. The rest will flow from there. If we go down a little bit in John chapter 10, the verses 27 through 29, he says, My sheep, listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me, for my Father has given them to me and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. You see the intimacy in that statement? My sheep listen to me. I know them. And they follow me. They, 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 they know my voice. They listen to my voice. It's not to get rid of that picture of this distant God that is up there just waiting for you to fail. Get rid of that. He's saying, man, I want to get up close in person. I want you to know me and be able to hear me when I speak to you. Intimacy, intimacy, intimacy. He wanted so, he wanted to be, he wanted intimacy so bad 
that he was willing to, 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 to leave heaven and come down here and walk among you and be mocked and be cursed and be spit on and be whipped and beaten and hung on a cross to die at the hands of sinners. That's how bad he desired intimacy with you. I think we spit in his face when we try to when we try to attain righteousness in our own strength. I think it's a slap in his face. Because it'll never compare to the work he did on the cross. I think it breaks his heart when we have to wonder whether or not he truly loves us and forgives us. I think what I felt when my daughter asked me if she was special to me is nothing compared to the Father's heart. Say you belong to him. No one will snatch that from you. We go back to Romans 8, chapter 2. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. Paul says, Because you belong to him, the power of the life giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Because you belong, because you belong, because you belong. I'm going to put this in perspective for you. When I first got saved, like I mentioned in the beginning, I gave my life to Jesus in a motel room. All I had was a trash bag of clothes, a needle, and a spoon. And uh, the mother of my first two children was pregnant with my second daughter. My oldest daughter was there. And so I, I had, a, had to make a decision on whether or not I was going to buy some more cocaine to shoot, to shoot up or whether I was going to pay for the room the next day. And I broke down and started crying because I had already called the dope man and told him to bring me some more dope. So as I'm looking at them in their innocence, knowing that I have chosen this poison to put in my vein that will wear out in just a few minutes after I shoot it up over getting them the shelter that they need because I've already destroyed our lives enough. I've already lost our houses. I've already lost our cars. I've already lost everything. All we got is our trash bags of our stuff. And here I am dragging my family around because I got this bondage and this, this, this addiction that I just can't shake. I didn't know how to shake it. People telling me I was going to hell was never going to be anything that ever changed my life. I needed an experience with the presence of God. I needed the love of God. I needed to encounter him. And as I looked at them, I finally, for the first time in my life, the drugs were not taking away the guilt and the shame. So I broke down and I cried out to God. And I said, God, if you're real, you got to change me. You got to change me, God. I can't do this anymore in my own strength. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't know anything about religion. I just desired a relationship with this creator that they said could change my life. And as I'm sitting there in this room weak, giving my life to Jesus, the mother of my oldest daughter, she woke up and she had this look of just frightened terror on her face and she, her face was turning red. Finally, like she took a big gasp of air and she started screaming at the top of her lungs. And I started telling her, be quiet, you're gonna wake Janessa up. What's wrong, were you having a bad dream? And she said that as she looked behind me, she could see Satan behind me and that he had his hand on her throat. And without moving his lips, he told her that she would always be his and she would never escape him. And instantly, I looked at her neck and I seen a handprint it's a supernatural experience that I never wanted to see. Most of us never ever see something like that and I've yet to see anything like it since that day. But I felt this evil presence in the room and I finally I got her to calm down and she stopped crying and a couple minutes later we're just sitting there watching TV and my oldest daughter wakes up. She looks around and she rubs her eyes and she looks around the room and she points to the corner of the motel room and she starts screaming bloody murder, Dad pushes to the back of the thing and she seen something that I couldn't see. She was seeing the same thing her mother seen. But when it happened to my daughter, something rose up. And 
I remembered how my mom, when I was a little child, she had a, she had a season of being on fire for Jesus in her life where she just became sold out for Jesus and she started teaching me about spiritual warfare and taking up my authority in Christ and binding and rebuking the enemy and, and all of these things. And as, 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 I, as I, I got up angry and I started to bind and rebuke this enemy, I just, just surrendered my life to Jesus moments earlier. I just given my life to him, and now all of a sudden I was given an opportunity to exercise the authority that was given to me in Christ. And I'm telling you, I did not, there was nothing righteous about me, only the righteousness of God. And I started to bind him and rebuke him and tell him his hand was no longer allowed to be in my children's lives. And I commanded him to leave the room, and I felt something shift in the atmosphere. And my daughter never hearing one word about God from my mouth because I was too ashamed to even mention Jesus in front of my family because of what I did. My daughter looks up at me, tears, but different type of tears in her eyes, and she puts her hands on my cheek and she says, Daddy, God loves us, don't he? And I broke. Yeah, he, he loves us. He loves us, and, and we're going to be okay. And for the first time in my life, I believe the word that came out of my own mouth. I needed to experience the love of God to be changed. Some of us need to go back to that moment. It says the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin. to God. Romans chapter 8 verses 15 through 17 he says for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear but you re received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out Abba Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and if children God then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. You see it? I mean, you, you didn't receive the spirit of, of bondage again to fear. But you received the spirit of adoption. That reminds you that you belong to God, that you're children of the Most High. We don't need any more sermons on seven steps to victory in our life. Amen. We don't need behavior modification programs. We need to continue to experience the love of God. That belonging. Some of us desire that type of love from our earthly fathers and never got it, so it's hard for us. It's hard for us to, to, to even, when, when we hear the word father, we think that we're not going to receive the love from him because we didn't receive it from our earthly parents and our earthly fathers. And that's a struggle. That was one of my struggles. Because I had a picture of what a father looked like. And it was the wrong picture of, of, of who my heavenly father is. Third, the love of God is inseparable. Romans chapter 8 verses 35 through 39 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither, pre neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it's so easy to read something like that. And it be familiar and have no effect on our life. But we are reading the words of a man who not only rejected Jesus, but was on his way to kill as many Christians as he could and believed he was doing a service to God. Held the coat while Stephen was stoned to death and was on his way with orders to arrest as many Christians as he could and kill off the same movement that he's now willing to die for. Because as he was on the road to Damascus, 
Jesus knocked him off his horse. That's what's happening to some of us in this room. Some of the things that, 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 that we place all of our security in, God has stripped it from us, knocked us clean off our horses. Praise God. And he experienced the love of Jesus that day. And he told him, he said, I'm, I'm going to show you, Paul, how much you have suffered for my name's sake. Told him how much suffering he was going to he was going to go through for his name's sake and for the gospel to be preached. But the love that he experienced was something he had never had before. He said, for your sake, we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. He said, I'm convinced. I don't just think God loves me. I don't just know it up here. He said, I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate me from the love of God. And I'm going to close with this scripture in Isaiah chapter 61. Read in Isaiah chapter 61. We see the purpose of Christ. See why he came here. What did, what did he come for? What was his mission? Then we get to see the result. What's the result of him coming down and us receiving this? It's so beautiful. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 11 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. This is the prophecy of the Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, watch this, to give them beauty for ashes. To give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. Let me go back to that, to give them beauty for ashes. Some of us, as I say those words, we already know what those ashes are. And God is saying, I give you beauty. If you just want to exchange it, you just want to exchange, you want to give me the mess, you want to give me the problems? You want to give me the depression? You want to give me the, the suicidal thoughts? You want, to give, you want to give me your anger? You want to give me the drug addiction? You want to give me the alcoholism? If you want to give it to me, i give you beauty for your ashes. Man, what a good promise. He said, I'll give you the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Watch this, that they may be called trees of righteousness. I love some translations say oaks of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. <laughs> that people will look at us and see trees of righteousness. They'll see, they'll see fruit from what we do. The planting of the Lord. That's, that's a work that he did. They shall reveal. Watch this. And they shall reveal the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations. And they shall repair the ruined cities. The desolations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the foreigners shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers, but you shall be named the priest of the Lord. They shall call you servants of our God. You shall eat riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. Instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land they shall possess double everything Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth and will make them, make with them an everlasting covenant. It goes on and on and on and on and on about all of the things that he came for and the result of that. He said that they, they'll rebuild the old ruins. They'll raise up the former desolations. They'll repair the ruined cities, the desolations of Many generations, strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the foreigners shall be your plowmen and your vineyards. But you will be named the priests of the Lord. I shall call you the servants of our God. Do you see the purpose in the work that He does? I'm going to give you beauty for ashes. I'm going to give you the oil of joy for mourning. 
I'm going to set the captives free. I'm going to heal the brokenhearted. I'm going to, I'm going to preach good news to the poor. I'm going to, all of these things that he does, he does, he does, he does. And, and notice that it didn't never start with what we did first. We'll always be on the receiving end, but once we receive it, we have to go out and give it away to other people. That's what he's saying. I'm going to give you purpose for your pain, but you got to use it. I'm going to heal your broken heart, but you got to forgive those who have hurt you as well. I'm going to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, but you got to you got to you got to take the ministry of reconciliation serious and and, and cry for him, for all my other children who are still lost to come back to me. And be named a priest of the Lord. Although my, my, my position in my church is pastor, every single person in here, every single person in here belongs to a royal priesthood. And there's a mission that God has for us. There's a purpose that God has for every single person in this room. But it stems from his love. It stems from that. It stems from that. Or we'll just be walking around empty vessels in vain trying to minister to other people. Bow our heads. Father God, I just thank you, God, for the word that just went forth today. God, you know the hearts of every person in here, God. You know every one of our failures. You know every one of our flaws. You know every one of our struggles, our insecurities. But yet you came for that. You said you give us beauty for ashes. So God, today as we choose to allow you to take those things from us and give them to you, God, we repent for trying to become righteous in our own strength. And I, God, I ask, God, I ask that you would start to just bring to remembrance, God, all the little moments that we had with you when we first came to you. That you would remind us of, of your goodness, God. God, we admit that we should be more hungry for you, but we're not. So, God, I ask that you would give us, increase our hunger for you, God. Help us, God. It's not natural for us just to receive. So, God, I pray as we go into the rest of this week, God, that we would just be in the flow of your love, your grace your mercy, your favor. God, I thank you for everything that you've done for each and every one of us in this room, God, and I just pray protection over all of them as they go home to their houses, God, and um, just bless every one of their children, God. I pray protection over them, God. I pray for healing for every person, every member of this church that needs healing right now. I just declare that by your stripes that they are healed. We thank you for that, Jesus. God, we pray for the leadership here. We pray for the elders. We pray for the board members. We pray for your pastors, God. I pray, God, for fresh vision. I pray for fresh fire, fresh anointing to come upon this whole entire congregation in this church, God. That they say, I want revival. They want revival. They want revival. They want revival, God. So I pray for revival to rise up in them. We come against any spirit that would come against their church, whether pharisaical, whatever it is, we bind it, we rebuke it right now in the mighty name of Jesus. We just dismantle every weapon that has been formed against this church, against this congregation, against your bride. Right now, we dismantle it in the mighty name of Jesus. And God, I pray for just freedom, God. Freedom in you, freedom in you, freedom in you, freedom in you, God, to be able to be a church that is contagious. God, that people just desire, God, that when they would look at the members of this church, they would say there's so much love for one another in this house that they got to belong to something other than God. God, that when the storms of life would break out around them, God, that there would be oaks of righteousness, God, that they would be planted by rivers of living water, bearing fruit in all seasons, that they would look at them and say, how do they have peace? How do they have faith? How do they have strength? That there's got to be something different about them, God, and it would be contagious to every person around this city right now. Forgive us, God. Help us to remember where we've fallen. We honor you, we love you, and we thank you. In Jesus.
Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank y'all for